scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with the 12th verse. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ Himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. <coughs> Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I ran across a commercial for a church this week that I just have to share with you. Has the heaviness of your old-fashioned church got you weighed down? Try us. We are the new and improved light church of the valley. Studies have shown that we have 24% less commitments than other congregations. We guarantee to trim off guilt because we are low cal, low Calvin, that is. We are the home of the 7.5% tithe. We promise 35 minute worship services and 7 minute sermons. Next Sunday's exciting text is a story of the feeding of the 500. We have only six commandments. Guess what? Your choice. We use just three Gospels in our contemporary New Testament. Good sound bites for modern human beings. We take offerings every other Sunday, and we, of course, accept every major credit and debit card. We are looking forward with great anticipation to our 150-year bicentennial. Yes, the new and improved Light Church of the Valley could be just what you were looking for. We're everything you always wanted in a church, and less. Everything is permissible for me. From what I just, we just read in 1 Corinthians, it seems like people have been searching for the Light Church of the Valley since the 50s. Not the 1950s, the double old 50s. The church was already having trouble with the folks in Corinth, Greece, who were wanting to take their salvation and stop on it. The Corinthians had already heard from Paul in his preaching what Paul later wrote to the Ephesians when he wrote, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Hearing that they were saved by grace while they were dead in their transgressions, while they were still living in sin, the Corinthians made a logical but not Christian jump. There are many times when our faith and logic have nothing to do with one another, and this is one of them. They made the logical jump, since they were saved by grace, that they could do anything that they wanted to, whenever they wanted to. Since they knew, as we do, that in God's sight, all sins are the same. If God forgives gossip, then God forgives murder, and even idolatry, all sins are the same. And of course, we all know that everybody gossips, so all sins are forgiven. You see how easily that logical leap can be made. In today's world, you and I are surrounded by temptations that are carrying all the temptations that the Corinthians faced, and even more. 
You know, I think the Corinthians had it much easier in their time. You see, they had to walk down the street to find some trouble to get into. Somebody had to actually walk up to them and tell them something for them to hear it or know about it. We, on the other hand, are bombarded on every side by ground-based radio, satellite radio, television, computers, smartphones, and every other sort of advertising that can't be put out, could try to convince us to buy, eat, drink, do, and think something. Most of it, at least most of it you see in ads, is legal, and therefore technically permissible for us. But how much of that stuff that is legal is good for us? We see so much of it. Everybody seems to be doing it. We usually don't take too much time to think about it. Whatever it is, if we want to do it, we buy it, eat it, drink it, maybe even smoke it, I don't know. But we do it without much thought because everything is permissible for me. How many of us have seen those wonderful television commercials of happy young people partying on a beach or in a, this time of year often they're partying, they're partying in a ski lodge, often with a fire in the background, with tubs and tubs and coolers and coolers filled with ice cold beer. Don't those people look happy? Every commercial like that I've ever seen was full of smiling, happy young people. And right now, there are 12 million American alcoholics looking for that happiness in the bottom of a bottle somewhere. They're not going to find it. Can you and I drink a beer, take a shot, or have a glass of wine now and then and be okay? Probably. For some of us, absolutely not. But for most of us, yeah, we can do that. Can we drink 6, 8, 12, or 24 of those things at a time and still be all right? No. We can do it, but we just won't be all right. Everything is permissible for me. If we stand outside the pressures of advertising, which I don't care how much you think you don't watch commercials, you cannot get away from them. They're one of those college-educated words. They are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They permeate our being. If we stand outside the pressures of all those temptations that surround us, we can see that actually beer and wine and other alcoholic beverages are no worse really than golf or fishing or antique car collecting or camping or hunting or football or gambling or whatever it is that we like to do that is perfectly legal and permissible for us. Many, many things are permissible for us. But are they beneficial to us? And if they are beneficial, if we think they are, you know, that often that's a subjective perspective. I like it, so it's beneficial. You know? I like cheeseburgers, but my cholesterol level tells me they are not beneficial. <coughs> are they beneficial not only to us, but to the reputation of Jesus Christ and his church? Because you see, we all represent Jesus and his church to everyone who sees us. Just like the commercials, we can't get away from that. In this age of progress at breakneck speed, you know, I've often thought about progress. It reminds me of my father going down the road with us and my mother says, we were, make, we were on the interstate highway. We hadn't, seen a, we hadn't seen a highway marker in a long, long time. We were making 75 miles an hour. My mother says, where are we? She says, I don't know, baby. We were making great time. <laughs> we didn't know where we were going, but we were getting there quick. So Sometimes I think progress is the same way. We don't know where we're going, but we're getting there quick. In this age of all this progress, we have lost something desperately important to us. And what we have lost is wisdom. 
Wisdom has two components. Experience, which we have a lot of, and ponderance, which we don't have much of. If we ponder it all, we don't ponder long, because if we do, we'll miss out on something. We'll miss out on buying, doing, eating, drinking, smoking, or using the latest thing. Because if we don't do it now, the next thing we know, there'll be a new latest thing. And we'll have missed this one, trying to think about it, now we won't ever get to do it again, because it's already been obsolescent, we can't even buy that stuff anymore. It's gone. We don't like to miss our chance. So we race down the road, flinging caution and consequences to the wind, and leaving wisdom in our rearview mirrors. Do our souls benefit from that sort of behavior? Or have we just given up soul care altogether because it frankly takes too much time? Abandoning soul care is permissible for us. You can look around and see how many of us have done it. It's permissible, but it is certainly not good for us, nor good for the reputation of the church and Jesus Christ. Now, in this passage we just read, Paul uses prostitution as his example because that was a problem, a particular problem, that the people in Corinth faced. You see, in Corinth, in Paul's time, there were, it was a very polygamous town. There were about a million gods in those days. And almost every one of those gods had temple prostitutes. And so, in order to make offerings to the temple more convenient, the priest sent the prostitutes out to every busy street corner. Hey, you know, you could go, in, you could go there, pay yourself a prostitute, you call it worship. That sound like a deal? It did in the Corinthians. Even after they converted to Christianity, they liked those temple prostitutes. You know? And so I don't really blame them for that, but it's still not right. It's still not right. It was permissible for them, but it was not beneficial for Christ and the reputation of His church. I doubt many of us struggle with that. The particular problem that strikes most of us, and boy, I mean, it's all over America, but west of about the Alleghenies, it's really, really prominent. The problem we have is that we consider ourselves and our life to be our own. We are seriously into rugged individuality, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Anybody taught that by your parents? Come on now, don't lie to me. We all know we were taught this stuff. And self-reliance. Boy, don't call on nobody if you can't fix it by yourself but me. I'm your dad. Don't you call on anybody yet. You soon, I'll be dead. You learn how to fix it by yourself. You can only count on yourself now. Anybody hear that? You know, and you know, I guess if you live 40 miles out on 5,000 acres, you know, that's probably true. Nobody can get there in time. But we know as Christians that there's a problem with that. It is, though, the thing that made America great. It got us where we are. So, it's, you know, we're stuck with that. What do we do with it? In all those things, it brought up pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and stuff, I think we remain much influenced by both our pioneer heritage and by some words that we probably all learned when we were in sixth grade. How many of us had to memorize Invictus when we were in sixth grade? Didn't y'all have to memorize poetry? Y'all had to memorize? No, nobody made you memorize Invictus? <clears throat> well, that's a good thing. Even if you recognize it or not, the words in Invictus by W.E. Henley at the end of the poem are these. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Yeah, I see people repeating it out there with me. You memorized it. I know you did. As Christians, we know that just not so. We are not our own. 
We are bought with a price, and that price is the body and blood of Jesus Christ himself, whom we gather around that table every week to remember. We depend on him. We depend on him not only for our salvation, but for the air we breathe. John said in the beginning of his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Indeed, the air that we breathe and the chemicals that make up our body, we owe to Jesus Christ because He was the Word that God spoke and created everything that we know. There are things that are permissible for us that are beneficial to us, to the church, and to our Lord and Savior and His reputation. One would be that we honor Jesus Christ with all the actions of our lives. 